live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette de Vidar. It's loud and becoming louder for most of us, your heart. We live in a time where in an unparalleled way, each of us is facing their heart one way or another, whether that's realizing that systems are unjust, markets are rigged, inequality is getting bigger, belief systems are outdated. Democracy, perhaps not as solid as we thought it would be. Securities are what we thought would be securities, such as savings, income, businesses, or illusions. And maybe you're realizing that the life you live is not really yours. So becoming more truthful, following your heart, and while doing so, impacting communities much bigger than you thought, our topic tonight. Good evening, I'm Nicolette Dividar. Purpose has gotten a different meaning, particularly during the last year. At this point, April 2021, most people we talk to have realized that there is more to life than the bottom line, profit, greed, and meaningless activities. Being in lockdown, the one thing that could not be shut down or shut out is the heart. Your inner voice, it keeps coming in louder and louder, doesn't it? Can you hear yours? So when are you going to stop ignoring it and act on it? During times of transformation and the magnitude of the change we're all going through worldwide, our hearts are calling in their purpose. It's the following your purpose that truly creates change and impacts communities. So how can you stop looking for external leaders and start follow the best leader you have? Your heart, that inner voice, the place where change really happens. My guests tonight are sharing their stories of where their heart led them and what that means for their communities. With me here in the studio is Casey Cooney, author of Finding Solace, a novel about a woman who's coming to terms with freeing herself from abusive marriages only to find herself confronted that life keeps dishing out lessons that keep repeating themselves until we've truly understood what's at the heart of the matter. My second guest is Michael Pink, founder of Investing in Communities, a platform where he's changing the way we buy and sell homes to benefit communities and the greater good, and have a bit more control over where your money goes. How that works and how it might benefit you, we'll explore. Welcome both of you on Smart Sustainability. It's great to have you on. Thank so, you, Nicolette. Casey and Michael, both of you, we live in a time where I feel most of us, or actually all of us, are kind of called to make a change and do something a little differently. So I think if, if the last year has given any of us anything, it kind of means coming to grips more with what you want, who you are, and what you really want to do with your life. So purpose, I think, is taking on um, a different meaning and, and as does healing. So both of you have followed your heart in a way and put things out. So I really would like to hear your story. I'm gonna start with you, Michael. You started investing in communities. Tell us about what that is. Thank you for asking, Nicolette. Investing in communities is our best way of doing the most good. As simple as that. It is a web-based social enterprise that gives the consuming public a better way to utilize the services of any real estate licensee anywhere in the United States. And it's been suggested to us by people who we think know what they're talking about that the model will prove valid in many other countries. And we're building investing in communities as our way of contributing by building something that supports the organizations and the missions of, of inspired people, really. This is our way of contributing. Okay, so let's clarify this a little bit. So when you say it's your way of doing this and people can utilize the service, break this down for us, please, in terms of what that means. So does that mean when someone buys a house or sells a house, a percentage goes to a certain charity? 
Well, yes, with one major qualification. Mm -hmm. The percentage that goes to the charity as unrestricted funding doesn't come from the buyer or the seller. It comes from the lucky broker or agent who has been given the brokerage opportunity. We are literally referring consumers to real estate licensees of their choice yep. in return for which we are paid a referral fee mm -hmm. and then we give away most of that referral fee as directed by the buyer or seller. Hmm. Now, it's not only for residential stuff, right? It also works for commercial. So Correct. In, in mm -hmm. fact, it, it works, Nicolette, for any real estate transaction for which agents and brokers are interested in competing. Does that include and, lease, leases? Oh office yes, indeed. Leases? It includes leases for office, retail, and industrial space. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So how exactly does that work? Take us through that. Okay. It, it really is as simple as this. Someone learns that we exist, that is a, a consumer interested in buying or selling a piece of real estate, Mm -hmm. or a company interested in leasing commercial space. Mm -hmm. There is a simple web form at our site where an individual would say, for example, I'm buying, I'm selling, or I'm buying and selling. A company also is able to tell us if they want a lease space. Let's for a moment talk about the residential side. Mm -hmm. The user would tell us how many bedrooms and bathrooms are they buying or selling, mm -hmm. what city, what neighborhood, on the same web form, they tell us the charity or school that they would like us to send the funding to. On the same web form, they also tell us that there's an agent whose services they're considering using. It could be a friend of theirs from the military or from a knitting class, or it could be an agent they used in the past. It does not matter. Mm -hmm. if, if the consumer doesn't ask us to contact a particular agent on their behalf, then we now have enough information ourselves to identify, let's say, three specialist licensees whose book of business and whose experience actually centers around the type of transaction that the consumer would like to have. The, whether it's buying or selling, the price range based on number of bedrooms and bathrooms, mm -hmm. literally the neighborhood in which they're interested, and after we've ascertained that the broker we're speaking with does specialize in that, we ask them a question. The question seems irresistible. And the question is very simply, would you like a referral? In our experience, the answer has been universally yes. We then enter into a conventional referral fee agreement, which we are able to do because investing in communities is licensed in Illinois as a broker and we're licensed as a broker for a single reason, so that it is License Act compliant for brokers licensed in any state to remit a referral fee to us. We then provide the consumer with the contact information for the agents, and the consumer knows that we have already determined that these agents are appropriate for their consideration based only upon an excellent fit between the specialization of the agents and what the consumer wants to accomplish. In other words, we do not attempt to identify agents who are generous. Okay, but now I have, Go ahead. Hang on a second. I, I do have a question on this one. So, Please. if let's say I wanted to buy a house and no. I, I go through one of the listed things, for example, Zillow or, or whatever it is, or I have a broker and, and they have a property that I'm interested in, how would that work then? That, would I then go to the Investing in Communities platform and say, this is what I'm interested in? How would that, would that work? So it's a great question, uh, Nicolette. Investing in Communities is able to work as long as the consumer remains what we would call a prospective client. Once the consumer has become the client of a real estate agent or broker, then investing in communities cannot operate unless the agent says, yes, I'm willing to do this. But okay. the power of the model mm -hmm. is that we have removed from the equation the need for any real estate agent 
to be generous as long as we are able to refer the consumer to the agent, even if they know each other already, then the model works. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the charities. Now I know you have charities that can sign up for it, but it doesn't have to be just charities, it can be nonprofits as well, right? Uh, thus far, we have made distributions to what are referred to as 501c3 mm -hmm. nonprofits. Yep. That is what the world thinks of as a public charity in the United States to which the public can make a donation and deduct it from federal taxes. Mm -hmm. But we're interested in, in expanding even further the universal applicability of our model mm -hmm. so that we will be able to fund potentially, we haven't quite opened this up at the website yet, but we're working on the idea of being able to fund places of worship mm -hmm. as well as actually individuals. And the individuals we would like to benefit are members of what we refer to as the professional angels. In our book, that includes educators, nurses, first responders, military veterans. So if you're buying or selling a home, and you would like us to send the funding to a veteran who is your nephew, we will gladly do that. Okay, hang on for a second. We need to clarify a few things. So when someone, a nonprofit, let's say, signs up on this, walk us through what the percentage would be. So let's say there's, I'm gonna sell a house, I'm gonna sign up on your platform. Let's take a fictive number. Let's say the house is, is worth in this area probably 500,000. What would happen to it? What's the percentage we're talking to? How much money can go to a nonprofit out of this? So if you look at the math as a function of the purchase or sale price of the home, mm -hmm. the distribution typically is just about four and a half tenths of 1% of the price. Mm -hmm. So a $500,000 home, if you're the buyer or the seller, without using the calculator, we, we would typically send a distribution of about two thousand mm -hmm. dollars if it's a three hundred thousand dollar purchase or sale the distribution is typically one thousand three hundred fifty mm -hmm. if it's a million dollar purchase or sale the distribution would typically be about forty six hundred dollars mm -hmm. and that would go to the nonprofit. but as you just said it can also yes. go to individuals okay now from a practical point of view, how could that work to send the money to an, in, to, to an individual? Wouldn't you be overwhelmed in offering this? Well, uh, no, I don't think we'll be overwhelmed. We'll see as we scale how that works. But we're under the opinion, or of the opinion that we will be able to scale significantly without experiencing an incremental expense mm -hmm. for each user. Mm -hmm. So it, it should be no more cumbersome for us, for you as our user, to fill out the form and give us the name of a teacher that you would like to fund, a mm -hmm. nurse, a, a veteran. Uh, that shouldn't be an issue. Can it fund creative projects as well? Yes, indeed. So really, so what you're basically doing is you're taking um, like real estate, which really is kind of the core, it's the heart of America, as I would like to say, is sort of a do something with that and, and redirect it, if you want to say it in a way, to something that the person who's the buyer or seller actually um, has a beating heart for in terms of what to support, what they think makes use of it. Yeah, yes, and I love the way you just articulated that because one of the ways we speak about what we're doing is that we are building a universal power tool mm -hmm. that anyone can use to power their passion. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it. So you're taking the core of the American heart, so to speak, the real estate, to power someone's passion. And I, I love that approach because I, I do think we live in a time where people become much more conscious of that. And I want to talk a little bit more about why you did it. We're getting there, but I want to switch to Casey here on this one because it's a great lead in. So we heard Michael's story and what it does. Now mm -hmm. you've done something very different. You wrote mm -hmm. a book mm -hmm. called Seeking Solace and we actually have it. Let me hold it up, it's right here. And <laughs> It's a novel, very yes. interesting novel that I actually think targets 
probably you know, one in three women, if you think about it, in the United States are in abusive relationships at some point in their lives. So tell us about the story of the book, Casey. Well, um, I just, I, I've always liked to write. So um, I, know, but I was working on this as um, starting with sort of a fantasy that I had about what I might have done differently if I was going to really have broken out and done something wild with my life. So there so, are some so there are some familiar experiences in there that have been incorporated in the novel. Her solution uh, is to go away from her support net and uh, start over. And then of course she makes all the same mistakes so, over again. So but tell <laughs> us tell us the story a little bit. So it is about okay. a woman. A She's woman named Hollis Murphy. And uh, she um, has been divorced, and um, and her first marriage was an abusive marriage, right? Yes. So um, she divorced. She, she got out of there. We meet her a couple of years after this. She's starting to realize that her her instant um, explosion of of happiness and joy is starting to fade and that she needs to actually start making her own decisions and mm -hmm. setting her own course. And uh, to do that, she feels that she needs to get away from her influences. She thinks, oh, I'll just take like six months, I'll go live off in another place and just do what I want to do for a right. while. Of course, she gets there and she kind of starts doing the same things she's been doing already. but. She makes a lot of really good friends along the way, and they kind of bumble through together. Um, she does end up with another boyfriend who's pushing her, starting to isolate her, and she just starts to realize it when um, it says, it's time to, time to stop this, I don't want to see you anymore, and he blows up and beats her up, and. Um, she has the thought that at least her ex-husband never touched her that way. It was all emotional. So, so. it was a different kind of a different, déjà vu uh, yeah. all over again. Yeah. So she found herself in a situation where she went through this all over again. And then what's, what's the quintessence of it? Um, with a lot more stumbling and fumbling, she builds the strength that she needs. Uh, she learns that she, she can't just walk away, she has to do more than that. She's got to rebuild. Walk away or run away? Well, either either walking or running. She, Once she's away, she has to build herself, mm -hmm. uh, find ways to replace what's missing, um, and um, learn to trust her own judgment mm -hmm. because she's, she's finding her, the head and the heart. Her heart tells her to do, one thing, but her head says, this is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. all, all the things that she was raised to do, the duty, the, the go out with the man who's got a good job, who's gonna be able to support you, even if you, you know, if your career fails, you've got that second income coming in. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things, and she starts really saying, no, you, you have to be with people who make you a better person, mm -hmm. and She's also do, doing that with some of her friends. She's got a friend named Mike that they kind of go on a semi-parallel journey, uh, building mm -hmm. up um, But she's learning other. from it, and then she's working through. They're learning what? from it. And mm -hmm. in the end, closer to the end, is to stop putting herself down. Stop denigrating herself. Mm -hmm. The learning process. Mm -hmm. What made you write the book? Um, basically, I finally had time to sit down and write. And um, I, I piddled around, but I wasn't working. I had a new, a new baby, and while she was napping, I wrote. So, magic. <laughs> mm -hmm. How long did it take you to write it? Well, the first draft only took about eight months. Okay, so. <laughs> the second draft, third draft, fourth draft, eighth draft, tenth draft, that now took a lot you, longer. You wrote in the beginning of the book, for those who refuse to be victims, why? Because in the end, that's, that's who needs to 
get the lessons that are in this story. Because they Be think of themselves because as victims? Not necessarily, that you think of themselves as victims. I would never have thought of myself as a victim, and yet yeah. I found myself in situations where I was pushed into things that were not, not appropriate. Um, okay. So maybe you have to identify what, what can lead you over that threshold of mm -hmm. I'm self-supporting, I'm dependent on somebody else mm -hmm. who hurts me, and you don't want to go there. So it's the breaking free process and it's the, it's the healing process. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I wanna ask you though, and I'm gonna ask Michael the same question then afterward. What gave you the guts to write the book about this? Particularly when, when you think about, you know, you're in a situation where, and actually I think that a lot of women have been in a situation like this, probably a lot more than most of us would ever admit that this has happened. So, how did you find the guts to write about it? To come up with the storyline and write it? That wasn't so much the gutsy part, sharing it was. Um, it, writing it, thinking of it, then putting it down on paper. And it, mm. of course it grows as you write it. Did you find it healing for yourself? Oh yeah, and, and hurt, you know, I cried over places and you know, mm -hmm. all of that, but I'm being in a marriage that's solid with somebody that I can rely on to, to tell me what's good about myself. Mm -hmm. um, those things, that helped a lot mm -hmm. with getting the nerve to, to, write to it. put it out there so other people could read it. Yeah. Now, Michael, coming back to you, when you started investing in communities, and I read about your bio, so you've traveled, you've been out, and, and things like that. Why did you start investing in communities? We started it as an experiment, really. Sharon and I, my wife and business partner, have always wanted to do good. We really never thought we had the wherewithal to do that. It, 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 it seemed that we didn't have enough money to give money away in mm -hmm. any significant way mm -hmm. and so we had the idea that if we could combine getting business with philanthropy then maybe we would find ourselves with a positive feedback loop and we would get more business which would enable us to give away more money which would then engender more business and that really was how it began that was the seed that we planted uh, just about 25 years ago and then we realized before long that if our competitors regardless of how large a company they might work with I'm talking about real estate brokerage company if they learned that we were pitching a prospective uh, client and we had included the pledge to give 10% of our commission to the client that this was typically a nonprofit that we would be pitching if our competition learned about this, in order to try to get the business for themselves, they said, oh, well, we'll do that too. Mm -hmm. And when we realized that we could induce essentially any real estate broker to adopt a philanthropic posture so that they could maybe get the deal, the light went off in our head and we thought someday we will do something much bigger and better for the world and eventually that turned into what we're now discussing. So the philanthropic thing though, what made you discover that this is what you found rewarding about the whole thing? Was this like an inner call for purpose? Was this just there? Or was yes. this more like out of great, you know, great marketing idea, great opportunity, and maybe it goes hand in hand, but what was the driving factor? The, the driving, uh, impetus, Nicolette, was we wanted to do good and we needed a way to be able to do that and we realized that we're representing lots of nonprofits. Our, our clients don't ever pay us because that's the way it works in our industry. Mm -hmm. Just as if you're using a broker to buy a house, you don't pay that broker, the seller does. Mm -hmm. When we represent office tenants, it's the landlord that pays us. 
So mm -hmm. we were able to say to, to nonprofits, if you utilize our services because of this experiment that we are beginning, mm -hmm. we will represent you on what will seem like a pro bono basis, but we will be paid a commission by the building owner. And mm -hmm. when we are paid that commission, we would like to give you 10% of it. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty nicely received by the executive directors that we were meeting with. Mm -hmm. And over time, we just realized that doing business, doing good is one of our service marks. And yes. it's just an incredibly wonderful way to be in business. And to know that when you go to the office, whether it's at home because of COVID time yeah. or at the office, knowing that just by doing that, we are helping ourselves and without being able to avoid it, we are helping the world. That's a pretty wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And actually, there's a big push for d doing well by doing good. It's been around for you know the last decade or so, but there's more and more push for it. And I do think we go into a time, and maybe you know you're experiencing that as well. That I think we we are in a unique time where everyone can really start listening to their inner purpose and can become the change they want to see. Really, in 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 the best of all things, I think with the technologies that's available, with how we can do this we can all do something that makes us much more the change makers than just sitting back and thinking there's nothing you can do about you know making the world a better place and and Michael use to use your platform even if you're just doing something as buying or selling your house you can still use that and kind of funneling the money you care for, for a purpose you care about to get it to that, those organizations. So how many people have been utilizing this? Is it growing? Oh, is there a tendency to grow? It, it is growing. We think that we have completed our prototype phase. We think that we are now ready for prime time and ready to scale. Mm -hmm. We have not even begun to scratch the surface of what's possible, mm -hmm. not even close. Mm -hmm. We are confident that this will happen and it will begin to scale. And we're putting some uh, things in place to make that, I think, much more likely. And it will be interesting for us to speak again uh, a year from now and I'll be able to report to you how things are going then. Yeah. In the meantime, we really have been building a very large pile of kindling and it's just beginning to smoke and just about to catch fire. Yep, and actually just to verify, um, Michael's organization has distributed up to this point, was it $685,000 to over 100 charities? So there's yes. a, a lot of potential that, that can grow. And you, you're not only focused, I mean, I know you're based in the Chicago market, but it's like all across the United States, but you've also funded international projects, have you not? Well, thank you for asking that, Colette. A single transaction so far occurred outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. It was in central Mexico mm -hmm. in a city called San Miguel de Allende. Mm -hmm. And because an American expat bought a home, which he was going to buy anyway, 260 school kids got meals for a week. Mm -hmm. And that's that could be happening in the United States millions of times a year. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Exactly. And actually, I want to cross you the lines a little bit with the two of you, because we know that a lot of women still, and it's really mind boggling to me, it's very mind boggling that in 2021, we still have a lot of women who find themselves in situations where you know, they're, they're in, in abusive relationships and it's hard to get out, even in this day and age. And I'm, I, I do know for a fact there are a lot of people who are trying to do something about this, but finding the funding has always been an issue. So to bring this up, Michael, if there were an initiative like this, could that be enlisted on your service, on your platform? We sure hope so. Yes, indeed, it's possible. We would like every organization that's doing progressive good work mm -hmm. to benefit from our efforts. It is our gift to them. There is no cost. Yeah, and what, what I really like about this, and I think we, we really have to emphasize that, is that if we, if we approach business a little bit different, we figure out that there, it's all so interconnected that whatever the business is you're doing, it really 
is supposed to elevate somebody else's life if we do it correctly. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, um, that's a real big issue. Now, coming back mm -hmm. to you, Casey, we heard from yeah. Michael the big why. We heard from you a little bit the why in terms of why you wrote the story. Yeah. What do you think the main message of the book is for women who read it? Um, what would you like them to take out of what this? What I would like them to take out of it is to be able to recognize if they're being isolated and or taken advantage of and um, to, be, to be able to, to get the, the strength they need to walk away or run away um, so that they can go and build better. There's always be there's okay. always better. But I think we need to address something yeah. here because you said like walk away or run away. I think there's a difference. There is a difference. So you can walk away from situations that you know are not good for you, but to run away, I think most people who try to run away from things, they find out that over and over again, you find you can run away, but you, you can't really run away because over and over again, you find yourself in exactly the same situation with different players, but you're still in the same situation until you learn your lesson. Right. And that is hopefully the, the, the hope that and you it sounded can to me learn that, a lesson. Yeah, and I, it sounded to me that Solace was kind of experiencing a little bit of the same thing. She was running away. Yes. And, and then, she called it running away. Yeah. And then, and, and of course, you know, when you're particularly when you're in that situation, I totally understand that. You need to cut the cords and go somewhere else so that it's, mm. y you need to heal. And for healing, very often, you need to cut the cords. Right. That's, and that's what it is. And, and it can be a physical getting away, or it can yes. be just a, or putting up a cutting wall off contacts, and, you mm -hmm. need to shut down and really kind of to heal, and the process takes time. And I right. think people underestimate that, especially because there time. is that initial euphoria of I'm out. Yeah, and then you think, okay, everything's going to be all right now, but it, it's slow. Every it's every slow. healing is is it's a slow very process. Slow. Every healing is a slow process, and I think the biggest issue that we all have or very often do, and that's not just in this situation, I think that's in other situations too, is that we think that whether that's trauma, whether that's something else, we feel that you can speed up the healing process, but you can't really, it's a process. And it's different for every person. It is very different for every person and it's a process. But mm -hmm. coming back to that, and now that I'm thinking about this, Michael, even when we take a different approach to, for example, healing our communities and investing in communities, maybe we need to remember that that too is a process and we can't expect like miracles overnight. Well, Just start small. Yeah. <laughs> We're not expecting a miracle overnight. Uh, we've been working on this for a long, long time. I know, you started really early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, are you seeing people in other states picking up on the initiative? Is it kind of getting out? Well, what's happening, uh, I think, is that the idea of social enterprise and doing business, doing good, mm -hmm. Um, uh, having a company that sells to product or service and that company also has a social purpose, I think that's washing uh, across the planet. And I don't yeah. think that that's going to go away ever. Yeah. It's being facilitated, obviously, by the Internet, which makes social media possible. And if you look at the um, studies of Edelman Worldwide, Cohen Porter Novelli, I will call these consumer sentiment surveys, the younger age cohorts, uh, to the tune of the 80th percentile in some cases, yeah. give a hoot enough about what it means to be a human, that if they're going to buy a product or service, they will sometimes, with frequency, pay more for it if they can buy it from a company that has a social purpose. Yes. And so, this approach is being adopted, I think, yeah. because business has no choice but to get with this program. In our particular situation, 
what we're seeing is that real estate agents, some real estate brokerage companies, are adopting a philanthropic aspect uh, and discussing that in their marketing materials. What they're attempting to do, though, legitimately is drive business to themselves. Mm -hmm. it, it's distressing to me, uh, I must admit, that most often there is a dearth of details about what is the extent of the philanthropy, how long have they been doing this. Um, the difference between all of that and investing in communities is that we are categorically not a platform to promote real estate agents or real estate brokerage companies. We are a platform to give consumers a better way to utilize the services of all real estate agents. And we think we are unique in that regard. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I certainly haven't heard about something like this. What was the acceptance, though? I mean, you're changing, you're changing a little bit, you know, the way the, the real estate business is done. And hopefully it changes the consumer thinking in terms of having an impact in terms of where their purchase or their money is going to go because they have a little bit of a control over that, right? Yes, but if I may, Nicolette, I want yeah. to uh, qualify what you said in this way. Mm -hmm. The consumer has total control over how we will distribute yes. the funds. Yes, how you However, do However, the yeah. funds are not coming at the expense of the consumer ever. Yeah. No, no, no. But the, the the consumer has some control in terms of where where the when I, when I said like you know the, the some of their money. If I want to buy a house or or sell a house, even if it doesn't come out of my expense, I still would like to have my purchase have a real purpose beyond what Indeed. you know what's Indeed. in there for me. Yes, and and our model is totally transparent, mm -hmm. and we do not decide who will get the funding. Hmm. If you ask us, gee, is there a charity uh, that benefits early childhood education or uh, nursing mothers, then we will very gladly put you in touch with such organizations. Mm -hmm. But we want to give the power to the consumer to choose the recipient of the funding. Mm -hmm. Let's go all through yep, yeah, let's go through some examples because I think it would help all of us to understand a little bit what that looks like. Can you give us some examples in what you've done sure. recently? Sure. Um, I've got some examples from the world of residential real estate brokerage and from the world of commercial. Mm -hmm. And uh, here are a few. Um, uh, John and Eva, this is a real couple, uh, were downsizing. They had both retired. They were selling a larger home in Chicago, buying a smaller one. Mm -hmm. They knew about it, investing in communities. And the charity of their choice as a result of those two transactions received $2,440. Mm -hmm. Is that all the money in the world? No, but it's unrestricted. There is no development expense. It's a straight charitable contribution. Mm -hmm. Bill sold his home, and Test Positive Aware Network received $2,530 at no expense to him. Mm -hmm. We talked mm -hmm. already about Gerald and San Miguel de Allende. Mm -hmm. um, Heather was selling a home in Boise, Idaho, buying a home in Portland, Oregon. Because of investing in communities, the Waters Elementary School on the north side of Chicago, which is a Chicago public school, received a check for $4,026 mm -hmm. at no expense to Heather. When Urban Partnership Bank signed a 10-year lease for 25,000 feet, $42,000 was given to 15 charities. The bank actually asked us if we would devise an alternative means of choosing the recipient. Mm -hmm. And so we had a random drawing to give away $42,000 in the lobby of their new office building one evening. Mm -hmm. And they liked the experience so well that they put a photograph of the event on the cover of their annual report. Mm -hmm. When the Sergeant Schreiber Center for uh, National Center for Poverty Law leased a little less than 15,000 feet, their IIC distribution was $25,000. Mm -hmm. 
when Prime Care Community Health opened a brand spanking new family health clinic, they received $30,000 toward their mission. This could be happening every single time someone buys or sells a property if they want to use a real estate agent and every single time a company leases commercial space. That means basically that almost every business could participate because most lease their office yes. spaces. Yes. And since Indeed. we are actually in a time of a lot of renegotiations of leases that are happening in office spaces and things mm -hmm. like that, so if you have a business, you might want to consider actually to put it to good use, your renegotiations, and, and kind of fund it on a broader level so some of that money and some of those transactions do benefit the greater good and some, some communities that really need the boost and some nonprofits that can really do great things with that. Right? Yes. So the yes, way to go do. is they could go to your website and then get more information on that. Yes. And sign up to, to sort of say what kind of nonprofit uh, you, you, well, as a nonprofit, you can kind of categorize and say this is what you do. But companies can also go and check out what you have and they can specify to you who they want to benefit. Companies can do that, individuals can do that. There is a very simple web form that takes, yep. I think, less than a minute to complete. It's entirely free to use. Mm -hmm. That's how to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Then we respond, sometimes within hours, always within a couple of days, unless someone contacts us on Friday night, then it won't be until Monday that we get back to them, typically. Mm -hmm. But yes, indeed, it could not be easier. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about how it was received. So I take it that other brokers, how, how was the reaction of colleagues and peers when you started that model? Well, <laughs> when we started the model uh, back in 1995, and it was just an experiment of our little company, mm -hmm. uh, a philanthropic program, um, I, I think that very few people took notice of what we were doing unless it was one of our competitors mm -hmm. who got wind of the proposal that we had made typically because one of the board members had been brought in on what was going on because the executive director with whom I spoke mm -hmm. told me I can't wait to start working together please call me in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, I'm going to talk to the board. Mm -hmm. And someone on the board said, wait a minute, this sounds like baloney. I've never heard a broker talk like this before. My company just redid its lease. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to the brokers we use to see what they have to say about this. And what they had to say about it was, oh, we'll do that too. Do you <laughs> so. think, so, so do you think if we take a long-term perspective, Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to disrupt the current business model in a way? I sure hope so. Where do you see we it go? Are, yes. <laughs> where, where do you see it go going forward? I see it going forward that one day, hopefully long before I have taken a powder, uh, the ordinary person will know about investing in communities and when they think about buying or selling a home to satisfy a need for their family, they will also think of the charity or school to which they can give important funding. Mm -hmm. There's a picture that I have in my mind of one of those thought bubbles from the cartoons that come out of someone's head, except <laughs> I see them coming out of every house roof that I see. And and I see words expressing the dreams and passions of the family that live in that house. And that's why I say that anyone can use investing in communities to power their passion. Mm -hmm. I hope that kids will say to their mom and dad, you know something, instead of buying another pair of Air Jordans, let's do something good and the family will not have to write the check on their checking account because we will write the check if they simply come to us before they engage a real estate agent. It's as simple as that. Hmm.
That's a big impact on people and communities. I, I totally understand that. And we hope it's going to grow in that direction. I actually think there's so much change going on that people are definitely more open for that and, and thinking that whenever you do engage in a transaction, you want to you wanna elevate someone else's life. That's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Now, Casey, what do you think your impact is going to be with the book? What are you hoping for? Really, um, I hope that the people who choose to read it will grow inside themselves somehow, uh, whether it they have that kind of experience or just to understand what other people may have gone through mm -hmm. uh, to be more open and generous and caring. So do you think this should be read by every woman? Oh, of course I do. It's a spark of genius. But um, I don't see why not. Um, anybody who likes a good book. You know, it's a good story there too, so it's not just, not just the heartfelt thoughts. I, I want to go into yeah. one lead-in sentence again. And you said yeah. this is for those who are not wanting to be victims. So I do want to yeah. pick back up on this one because I think we also live in a time where we see a lot of blaming and yes, we, we see do. a lot of finger pointing. So whether this is in politics, whether this is in economics, whether this is in the office space or things like yes. that, there's a lot of finger pointing in yes. both directions and blaming others. But the thing is, whenever you blame someone else, you actually give your power away. And I think for most people, that's maybe something that we haven't realized so much, but it is true. Whenever you blame someone else, you give your own power away. Yeah. And I think once we start realizing this, then shouldn't that automatically kind of bring us back into ourselves and kind of start taking responsibility, whether this is in how we spend our money, how we engage in business transactions, mm -hmm. but also in how we take care of our personal lives? Yes, uh, and th there's a balance that people have to find between taking responsibility for their lives and for how the world around them may make their lives harder or easier. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what, what makes you not a victim in this? How do you describe it in the book? Um, What's the quintessence? It's, the, it's to be strong enough within yourself that you can look at the world in a way, it's hard to say, um, it took me a lot, a lot of words to say it, um, where you're not putting yourself down, mm -hmm. you're living in the reality of this is who I am, this is what I'm good at, this is what I'm not so good at, but and finding how to use what you have that makes you stronger, better, more productive, uh, building uh, internally. And it's probably not a direct answer to your question, but it, so along it's, those it's lines. It's more yeah. like standing up for yourself in a way. Oh, that's well, first, part of you it. need to know what yourself is all about. That's very true. Because if you don't know what yourself is all about, it's kind of hard to stand up for yourself if you don't know what it's yes. all about. And for a lot of us, it's, it's very easy to, it's easier to find fault with yourself and think other people are better. You know, I say your, your own toughest critic. But you know, very it's very often, true. But very often it's the subconscious thing. So sometimes you think negatively about yourself without even realizing that. <laughs> and that's what sabotages it. I think mm -hmm. even if you go out openly and say, you know, I stand up for myself and stand by myself, but yet it's those limiting, those under, those subconscious underlying beliefs mm -hmm. that sabotage this whole process. So did Solace find out about this in the story? Yes. She yes, did? She went through a lot of phases, but pretty much by the end, she was in the position of actually being able to help other people find themselves. Okay, so if you find so. yourself, you can help other people mm -hmm. find themselves. Mm -hmm. And then That's of course that also leads up to, to a clearer purpose. So we talked a little bit about the impact in going forward. 
We talked about Michael's um, impact of, of the communities. Now let me ask, and that question actually goes to both of you. Do you think there is a correlation of the experiences you go through in life to what then brings out your purpose? I'm going to start with Michael on this one. Well, I, I wondered where this came from in my mind. Why, why is it so important to me to do this? Mm -hmm. And I think that there has been something in there all along. I can tell you that I feel unbelievably lucky mm -hmm. to have found myself in the middle of building, investing in communities because I have never felt so purposeful. Mm -hmm. I have never felt so alive. This is absolutely what I need to be doing. So you could not even imagine doing something different, something else? I couldn't stop doing this if I had tried. Hmm. What about you, Casey? Well, I do love what I do. I believe that all of our experiences add in to help us figure out the world. And the more we figure out the world, the easier it is to find what it is that we should do mm -hmm. to better ourselves and the people around us. And there's a lot of saying that the most painful experiences are the greatest store openers in life. Yeah, they can they're the be. gates that yeah, push they, forward. They they're be. the gates that move you through. They're the gates yeah. that show where once you do the shadow work and you come out on the other side. You realize you couldn't have stopped where you were. You, you yeah. had to go forward or backwards or sideways. But yeah. that place where you were, yeah. you can't stay. Michael, in terms of the nonprofits that have been participating in your program at this point, is there um, sort of like a, a red thread in terms of what type of nonprofits are more of in there right now, or is it fairly evenly distributed? No, I, I think it's fairly evenly distributed. I can tell you that, um, and, and I want you to let your hair down and let your mind wander as broadly as possible when you construe what I mean by these, but women and families, health and wellness, arts and culture, education, environment, and social justice are the six focus areas that we chose a long time ago mm -hmm. to articulate the breadth of what we're trying to benefit. Mm -hmm. That certainly doesn't mean that we don't want a men's shelter to benefit. Yeah. I think that the large national nonprofits are too big uh, still really to be able to see our existence. Mm -hmm. It's my expectation that uh, in that one day there will be many, many, many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of charities and schools all over this country and in many other countries that will be a part of investing in communities. Because it's all purpose-driven and purposeful investment and, and local communities, I think, um, they everywhere where you live, I think there is a new localism in terms of people understanding that it's the communities you live in, it's the communities you want to benefit, it's the people you want to benefit there, it's the people you want to you want to boost up. Let's talk about your support network in a second and how this was react what was kind of accepted. So we talked a little bit about Michael in your case about how it was accepted by peers and colleagues. What did your wife think about that? Was she all in? My wife? Yeah, your, par your yeah. business partner, yeah. Sharon is my partner, yes, indeed. Uh, Sharon is about the most thoughtful, giving, compassionate, caring human that I've ever met. So it's a shared purpose? Yes. Yeah. What about, yeah. How, how supportive, when you started writing your book, yeah. particularly about a topic like this, Casey, what was the reaction of your, so do they even know you wrote the book? Let me ask you A this A lot way. of people don't. I um, figured. My husband, of course, has always been very supportive and um, he doesn't read books, really. He's but he knew read you it were a couple writing of times. A but you knew he, you were writing about this? Yeah. Um, and what about your family? Do they know? Yeah, of course they know. Um, and I think they've all bought it. 
um, and they may have read it. <laughs> I, I only know one for sure, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a mixed thing, and I think a lot of people are very afraid that they're not going to like it, what I've written, and that they're going to have to tell me that, which you know makes makes them like, okay, well, I, I'm going to ignore it's there because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to have to her, her come to me and say, did you like it? And then I don't want to lie or, right. or whatever. But it's about but, a fictional character, but mm -hmm. it's, it has some elements in it that were experienced. Now, yes. do people that know your own story, do they know that there's kind of this fictional character who, who has gone through something similar, albeit a little different? Uh, some do. Some don't? Um, okay. Some don't. Um, some of the people that I see more now, is this, these things happened to me a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And my life has been so much better. And I've met a lot of people in mm -hmm. that better life. So um, they don't necessarily know so what, how many what my experiences are. So how many years after it happened to you did you actually write the book? Oh, how many years went by? Maybe 15. Could you remember all the things then that happened? Because oh, I would find that difficult. Oh, no, but there's certain things that stand out. Okay. There are things that yep. um, even may not have been important at the time, but mm. they, they, they come back. Okay. And you're writing the character, and you're putting that character in a situation. Yep. Things pop up. And your book is available on Amazon, right? So yes. Seeking Solace is on Amazon for mm -hmm. those who want to read it. And um, Casey thinks every woman should read it. So oh. let's find out. <laughs> Any last words? We only have one minute left. And I want to drive, of course, a lot of nonprofits to Michael's website to actually you know, sign up for this so we can make this bigger and bigger okay. anyway. Any final words that you have for, for our viewers and, and us to take along from this conversation, Michael, tonight? Honestly, Nicolette, I'm just very, very grateful that you invited me to participate. This is a wonderful way for investing in communities to get more exposure. And I hope that people will come to us and I'm easy to find. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be very happy to answer questions and assist individuals and companies and charities and schools. Yep. Come on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Casey, for coming on. Thank you, Michael, for coming on. Thank you for being with us tonight and, and watching. And uh, I hope you find a way of investing in your community. You can go to Michael's webpage. We'll actually show you where to find the information. And you can also read up on Casey. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week. Good night. Thank you. Thank you both. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was very good. So I do want to see if we can link the two of you up. Yeah.